and his colleagues, they're the ones who originated the term meta literacy. And the other forward is like Robin Van Deniker. Um, he's a philosophy professor in the Netherlands who, who has adopted the term meta modernism. So I'm going to talk about two new terms today. And these new terms help us better understand how the internet has changed literacy forever <laughs> and changed the way we read, write, and enter information and produce it. This is a fast overview because every chapter in my book, all nine chapters, could be a presentation, a standalone presentation. I want you to zoom in on the first slide here. The Gutenberg parentheses have closed for 500 years since the year, well, 1500 to about the year 2000, the book was the king of the information highway, highway and hierarchy. But, uh, and prior to the Gutenberg press, books were not even available to most people. And then they became the top information format. And who loves books? I know we all do. I love the covers, the pages, the smell, the paper and the ink. But Professor Lars Sauberg suggested that the Gutenberg parentheses have closed. They've ended. And those 500 years were an amazing era, but they closed. And literacy is no longer reading and writing. It's taken on new dimensions. I'll put a little bit in text chat. There's a link if you want to learn more about the Gutenberg parentheses. We've moved on to chapter one, which is the background of metamodernism and metaliteracy and, and how things have changed. Now this term I'm talking about, meta-literacy, it's not to, re to replace information literacy, but it really, it really focuses on how we live in digital culture and we juggle information all day. And that's meta-literacy. I was just juggling it just now, troubleshooting my mic and, my, and all the things to pr present this presentation. This is meta-modern culture and this is meta-literacy. Postmodernism has ended. And I go into more detail about that in the book. Postmodernism brought us the deconstruction of grand narratives, and it sought to tear, to tear down many social mores and biases, particularly in Western culture, as we move toward a more global world. So how many of you are aware, and you can type in text chat, that postmodernism is over? And there's this sensation since about the turn of the 21st century that Times have changed. Do you sense that? If you do, you can type in the text chat. A, a suggested name for our new era is metamodernism. And I've chosen to adopt that name, even though there are other names in the running. We won't know for sure because we're, we're in it. But you know, once uh, as history moves on, there, there will be a consensus on the name. Metamodernism is filled with oscillations. And it reminds me of the spiral of life. I'm going to move on over here. Uh, you also see my meta, meta, meta meme there. <laughs> because meta literacy in the metaverse, how meta can you get? <laughs> if you scroll in on where I'm standing by, writing is also a spiral as you're thinking and pre writing and re revising and reflecting. The process is like life, it's a revision process. We move through seasons over and over, yet each year they bring something new to us. Well, that's sort of a spiral and also an oscillation. And just as reading and writing are recursive, metamodernism looks back at the past with respect for tradition and history, but also looks toward the innovation of the future. That is the foundation of metamodernism. And my book goes into a lot about how the internet has changed and is changing our human brain. One reading specialist says that children in the future will develop five literate brains that will be able to switch between digital and virtual spaces and physical spaces. As I uh, wanted to mention that gone is the dystopian postmodern view that is full of irony. Metamodernism oscillates between irony and sincerity. That's just one example of the many opposing ideas that metamodernism allows us to oscillate between. So um, you know that the internet has changed literacy primarily from reading and writing to juggling texts, emails, notifications, incoming you know icons, emojis, hypertext links, all kinds of apps on screens, and all of this is part of metaliteracy. 
I go in in chapter two to talk about how this affects every generation. It affects the older generation, the traditionalists who were born before 1945. It um, affects the baby boomers that were born um, post-World War II, 1946 to 1964. It affects Generation X, 1965 to 1980. The millennials, 1981 to 1996. And Generation Z, born 1997 and yet to be determined the exact ending date. These generational age groups, they each have unique digital citizenship skills to become literate in our metamodern era. Of course, they overlap. Um, and some of the challenges they face that all these age brackets are understanding privacy, security, and we have an internet security specialist here. Eric Moore has a room here all about internet security. We need to understand um, the evaluation of information, understanding that best practices of you know, in taking our information and producing it. So how many of you feel like literacy has simply changed within your lifetime? I know for me as a librarian, it certainly has. And um, we move on into, in the book, yes, uh, Betty Martian is saying, yes, it has totally changed. Now, chapter three goes into how it's changed because we have all of these digital devices and digital trends. And Goldrick and Goldrick talk about the five disruptive devices that are impacting higher education, which are online learning and MOOCs. We're in a MOOC right now, and everyone has been forced to go online because of the virus. So, of course, this is a huge change for a lot of people. But, and then there's competency-based education that's changing the way we, um, as educators, the way we teach. The Internet of Things, how everything is becoming more and more connected to the Internet. Virtual reality and augmented reality, which many of us here at the Digital Citizenship Museum are exploring, and of course, artificial intelligence. So literacy experts are, are critical of the use of digital devices for very young children, yet right now, many of them are having to use them rather than learn face-to-face. -face. Reading and writing, most experts of child development believe should be introduced without screens and digital devices, devices should be purposeful and they should be age appropriate. I'm trying to hurry because we are a little bit of a late start. But you can see on, I'm facing the slides that, that show that we are oscillating between all of these different virtual and physical tools in metamodern culture. And we have to learn how to balance these opposites. Have any of you seen very young children with digital devices and are any of you concerned about the overuse of screens or even screen addiction? It's imperative that the next generation learn to juggle multiple literacies and to balance all of the seemingly contradictory and opposing concepts that we encounter in all these various mixed realities of digital culture. Now, chapter four is fascinating because chapter four we're, um, starts discussing the digital dark age and the dark side of digital culture. So I'm going to be clear that we are, it's possible we could enter a digital dark age. Because, and here's a reason why. Too much information is just as pro problematic as too little. And today, most of our information is born digital thousands and thousands, if not millions of pieces of information being uploaded every day. So this can be a problem if we don't learn how to archive it. And some of the problems on the next slide over here that we deal with that are problematic in digital culture are personal dashboards where we all personalize what's coming in, confirmation bias where we only follow people who think like us, and resource evaluation not understanding how to evaluate misinformation, fear of missing out, FOMO, in the edited life, where young people spend more time taking photos of themselves and editing them than they do actually living their lives, too much information coming at us every single day, the death of privacy, which I like to say happened in 2008, and that's, up for, that's up for grabs, big data and cybersecurity, these are all problems of digital culture that we all need to begin to understand. And how many of you are concerned with some of these problems? 
I know that there have been um, congressional hearings for big tech companies like Facebook, Google, and legislation may be forthcoming that will help in some ways. Perhaps the companies that do come up with solutions will win big, but um, that is yet for us to see. Digital archival is a really big concern for the future, and I discuss that more in chapter. But the crux of this book, the main point is that literacy has changed and we now need meta literacy. So as that one meme with Jan Brady says, meta, 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 what is it? Well, it's learning how to juggle across, among, between, after, juggling all the different kinds of literacy and the need to think about our literacy and how it's changed. So Mackey and Jacobson say, metal literacy presents a way to advance information literacy by focusing directly on the relationships among all these different kinds of cognitive literacies and by clearly identifying the influence of emerging technologies on mobile, open, and network learning. In other words, digital culture changed literacy forever, and so we need to think about it differently. You need to think about it as meta literacy. You can see on the slide I'm facing a few of the colleagues that work here at the Digital Citizenship Museum, both in physical and virtual spaces, as they swing from physical to virtual worlds, juggling tools like Discord, troubleshooting like I did before the presentation today, and trying to maintain that sense of balance and, and just going with it and dealing with it and being comfortable. Are you comfortable with all these changes? in global digital online communication, Twitter, Discord, all these different um, ways that we learn. Feel free to type in the, yeah, um, Maggie's saying sometimes, and sometimes it gets kind of difficult. Well, the book also, besides focusing on metal literacy, it places us at this new era of history that we call metamodernism. So one chapter is devoted to explaining what metamodernism is, how it moves from postmodernism which was make it new with um, music, architecture, literature, all that was happening in the, in the, the, um, the 20th century uh, and how it changed as we moved into the 21st century. And you can see if you can zoom in, which is helpful to do on this particular computer, uh, there's a quote there about weaving meta literacy into our meta modern world. So we've moved from going beyond the deconstruction of grand narratives and tearing, tearing down all of the traditional ideas and the rise in irony and dystopian outlooks toward a new sincerity, toward even room for hope, some people believe. Our fast-paced culture is not without problems. And these problems often point to the need for balancing opposing sides and for respect for his, what has come before us as we spend most of our time with incoming information. How many of you agree, as I've been talking about these changes taking place within our culture, that there is a, this sense of feeling, and that's what I keep reading when I learn and research about metamodernism. It's a sense of feeling. It impacts art, music, architecture, literacy, and, it, and the feeling has arisen around the turn of the century. There's no set date. But as we move on to chapter seven, it also moves us towards learning environments changing and becoming more meta. We have balancing physical classrooms and virtual worlds. And here we are right here in a MOOC, in a virtual environment. Many educators have been thrust into virtual modes of teaching this year due to COVID-19. So this chapter, I know most of you here at the MOOC will be very familiar with, um, the different ways to learn in virtual environments and the best practices for them. Even young, young students are learning how to code. They're learning digital citizenship in, and learning digital tools. They're learning in places like Minecraft, which is a virtual learning environment. Of course, the advantages of virtual worlds for learning are presented in this chapter. Can anybody that's here, since all of you in Kite are familiar with learning in virtual worlds, can you name an advantage that we have right here in a virtual world that we might not have in a physical classroom?
For me, it's the sense of presence, that all of you are right here in a space that's my research office space, and here you are in it with me. And I know you, and it is a real space. Um, and uh, Eric is saying teaching spatial recognition, recognition skills. You feel that space when you're in a virtual environment that has beauty space. You don't get that on a flat screen. Yes, Maggie says co-presence. So these are some, some advantages that we get in a virtual environment that we might not get, say, in just a webinar where we're doing a lecture. So this chapter, of course, is a, an important chapter for those people who are wanting to explain virtual environments to other educators. And um, I have found that this book is more likely um, accessed through each chapter, which can, can be um, downloaded and accessed individually, rather than in hard print, a hard copy, which has all nine chapters. But this would be a chapter that educators might be interested in when you're um, when you are exploring the difference between face-to-face, -face, physical classrooms, and virtual environments. I mentioned in talking about the dark side of digital culture and a lot of the problems that we face, and I do have parents that sometimes when we're talking about these issues, talk about being frightened for the future, for their children. And I don't like to hear that people are frightened. That's the point of the book. The point of the book is that we need to find ways for the next generation to learn without being frightened, to learn the best practices for digital citizenship. And one of the problems I mentioned in that chapter is the problem of preserving literacy formats, whether they're print, digital, audiovisual, 3D, like this 3D space we're in right now, virtual or augmented. Certainly archival in the digital age has presented some real challenges for our future. You've witnessed a lot of changes in format in your lifetime, I'm sure. Formats from, we all listened to, we used to listen to audio tapes, cassette tapes. Somebody might be old enough even to remember records, <laughs> even the old, you know, 45s, and, and then of course eight, eight tracks. Uh, and then of course we had, for movies, we had VHS tapes. And it, a lot of these formats have become obsolete. And so too have the machines that read them become obsolete. I follow uh, on Twitter the Museum of Obsolete Media, and it's so interesting to see some of the media formats that now you can no longer read. It's very difficult to find machines that will read those formats. One story as I was researching preservation for the future of different formats, a story that really hit home came from an archivist who said that he had stored some really important important data on floppy disks years ago. And you can see the floppy disks on this um, slide that I'm facing. He had some important data on the floppy disks that became corrupted. And he realized that he had lost all that data and there was no way to retrieve it. And then that same week, he read an article about the Dead Sea Scrolls being unearthed after 2,000 years and that we are able to decode them. It really hit home. That we could, we could archive something that was 2,000 years old and yet something that he had just written shortly before then was lost forever. It's a scary thought. And the digital archivist of the United States, his name is David Ferriero, he suggests that digital archival is imperative to the future of civilization since most documents are born digital. In fact, he says that this is one of the things that keeps him awake at night. Numerous individuals have warned of our entrance into the digital dark age if we don't seriously address digital archival. As media formats change and they become obsolete, we have to migrate them to the latest format, format and make sure that we have a copy in more than one place and it's not always easy. And this applies to each one of us as individuals. Remember when you were a child and you could find old photos in a photograph of your grandparents? A lot of people are not making old photos, even printing photos and putting them in a physical location. Will the future generation stumble upon the photos of great grandparents if they're not archived? Have any of you had issues with digital archival, such as 
struggling to organize and retrieve your photos and your own personal documents? And yes, Maggie's saying she's drunk if Microsoft gets rid of OneDrive or if Google goes under because so many things are in Google Drive and OneDrive. And if we're outsourcing all of our personal photos, what does that mean for our future? It's an interesting thing to think about. It says on this slide, the inability to access historical information in the digital age due to outdated file formats, obsolete hardware, or data that becomes inaccessible or corrupt could lead to what is called the digital dark age. And we do not want to see that happen. We actually have an underwater archival museum room right here at the Digital Citizenship Museum in Kitely. And if we have enough time at the close, we might just walk down there. The final chapter of the book really sums up what digital citizenship is all about and how we need to embrace it. It's a critical issue for the future of education and for our children and our grandchildren in the future. You can see on this slide, you see this everywhere you go, people with their digital devices in hand. It includes a wide range of concepts that impact all of us, um, and it certainly impacts literacy. So this is the Digital Citizenship Museum, and I hold my office hours here every Saturday currently at um, 2.30 to 3.30 Pacific time right here in this office, but I also take people to all the other digital citizenship museum rooms so that people can become aware of all these different concepts. And I encourage you to come back here in Kitely to explore many of these elements so that we can share them and become aware of privacy, archival, best practices of social media, which a lot of people misuse <laughs> and have a lot of horror stories of things that have happened there, um, and evaluating information in what has become called the post-truth era. It is very difficult today to find truth online. And uh, many more elements of digital citizenship. It really becomes at an early age important for us to realize that we are digital citizens. I used to ask fourth grade parents at the teacher night, how old do you think a child is when they become a digital citizen? And most of them said, oh, probably about nine or 10. And I pointed out that a lot of them had sonograms posted of children before they were even born. So perhaps you could become a digital citizen even before birth. And Dawn is saying that the DMCA allows libraries to make preservation copies for items where the format is obsolete. Knowing places like this exist are important because they can help us as we're migrating formats and, and trying to preserve different types of information. So I've talked a lot in this book about metamodernism, and you can look up more about it later. It's a term that really kind of captures the fact that our world has changed. But whatever you choose to call our current cultural moment, we all know that, that times have changed and everything's changed due to our digital devices in our pockets. Some scholars, including myself, have adopted the term metamodernism to name this philosophical area, but we shall see. But I think all of you right here are metamodern digital citizens. Some of you are here in Kitely. I see you walking around right here, walking around my research slides. Some of you are viewing, perhaps chatting on Zoom. Some of you may be watching this on a recording on YouTube. This is meta literacy, developing new skills, juggling them, oscillating between them. So what do you think of these terms, this nomenclature? Sometimes we come up with too many terms, too many new academic terms, acronyms, but I think it's important that we do discuss the fact that times have changed. And perhaps meta literacy and meta modernism help help us focus and, and zone in, you know, zoom in on what, what that means. Uh, Maggie says she's ported over from Digi Worlds and in Zoom. So you could be in another world and you hyper gridded over into this world like Mag Maggie did. That's certainly a meta literacy skill. 
So and Maggie's asking, when I was learning about postmodernism, I was wondering what would come next. And yes, metamodernism, she says, could be a, a really great term, term. And I followed a lot of scholars who agree, and, and get, I didn't invent either of these terms. And if you read the forewords that were in my handouts, you can read more about the, um, the people who have coined these terms, metaliteracy and metamodernism. You can see on my last slide over here that I'm facing, perhaps the consensus will be to adopt, adopt the term metamodernism. And you can see I have a few references from what I talked about today um, above my book. You click on it and it will take you to more information about the book, which is also on Amazon. But I think um, I think it's important that we all, whatever your niche is in virtual environments, that you understand that digital citizenship is important to everybody, no matter what age you're in. So I'm going to be open for some questions, but, and you can also see that on my desk there, if you come in and I'm not here, you can uh, drop a card on the desk over here. I want to point out, for those of you that are not aware, um, I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library, and the Digital Citizenship Museum is an out a branch of the Community Virtual Library. Our main branch is in the virtual world of Second Life. And I'm going to ask you to follow me underwater, and we're going to close this session at the underwater archival room. So if you'll walk out my office door, um, we'll walk over to the bridge, and we'll go underwater where I can open up for some questions. So follow me this direction. I'll walk slowly to the bridge so you don't get lost. I'm going to step right here. These are the stairs to the underwater archival room. And um, I'd like to mention that Marie Vans is our curator here of the Digital Citizenship Museum. And there's some re research down below underwater on archival, even archival of virtual worlds. Um, because uh, if your virtual world disappears and a lot of work is lost, oh, it's such a sad feeling for educators. Let's go down underwater. This is our underwater archival room. Just gonna hide that. And I'll wait and see if everybody comes down here. You can see that we have some presentations down here on archival, and one of them is about Arcadia, which is a sim that was lost. And um, Allie was a woman who had Arcadia Island's beautiful sim, and it was completely lost. But she was able to save ore files and then share them with other people to help us understand how we can archival, archive virtual worlds. So we are learning about ore files here and perhaps archiving some virtual world content. But there's a lot of other things about archival down here in the underwater archival room beyond archival of virtual worlds with ore files. If you follow me this way, you'll see some other research. You can see this one is about preserving virtual worlds, educational events using social media networks and cloud storage services. That's a little bit about ways that we can um, archive. And um, this is, you can see we have a lot of room to grow. Our digital citizenship museum is growing. We have room to add other offices. If there's someone who's doing research, we will give them another office. This one is about, um, a blueprint for preserving virtual world cultural heritage using something called Preservica and Custom Metadata Schema. We have one on personal digital preservation. A lot of people, I know even my daughter-in-law has been um, really challenged, she's a musician, challenged with not having um, records any longer or even 
you know, everything going to MP3s and organizing them. She has a lot of trouble organizing for MP3s and organizing all of the family photos. And you know, for people to organize their own personal um, personal information can sometimes be difficult. And we don't want people to lose what they have, uh, you know, what, what they have that's personal. You can see there's some other slide shows down here um, why digital preservation is important for everyone. Yes, it's very time consuming. And, you know, if you're not trained on categories, how to label things, you can spend hours searching for particular photos, presentations, files, and, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's, it can be really frustrating when you've lost something. Keep going this way. There's a couple presentations down here on digital legacy. What happens to people's digital content after they pass away? We had a, an educator, a man who died and was in second life, very active and had wonderful educational content. And um, there's been several presentations on how difficult it was because no one knew how to access that content that he had created. And I know there are, um, there are a lot of people working on this. Even social media companies are working on how they can help archive people's content after they die. And there are some companies working on that, digital estate planning, where not only will we strive to understand what to do with people's physical things after they pass away, but what we can do with their virtual assets. And perhaps some people may have even more content in a virtual format, or a digital format than they do in a physical format. If that's not meta literacy and meta modernism, I don't know what is. <laughs> we, we live now in virtual and augmented spaces. And, but it happened so quickly. It happened before many people could understand that, that we need to know how to organize our content. So this is our underwater. Um, our underwater room, we'll keep walking this direction, and then we can walk, we'll walk, you'll see as we walk deeper into the darkness, it'll lead back around to stairs. You can see how much room we have to fall here. And I think it's kind of a metaphor for the fact that everything can be washed away and buried underground if we don't understand what we're doing with virtual worlds and digital content. So follow me, we'll walk around the stones. So you can see we have a lot of room to grow down here underwater in our virtual underwater archival room. But let's walk back up to the main digital citizenship and maybe we can get a shot at the whole island up here. If you, um, if you take your camera and pan around the island, you can see that we have rooms on all kinds of topics from cybersecurity, authentic online and having an authentic presence rather than being anonymous or having a, you know, a, a fake presence, um, from social media blenders to teaching really young children how to be digital citizens to um, Eric Moore's cybersecurity room, to the future of the metaverse, and even a, a three-story virtual reality museum. There's a number of us that are exploring virtual reality headsets to compare them with virtual environments. Have any of you here at our session today tried a virtual reality headset? You type a yes or a no in text chat. Yes, well, I'm not sure if you'll agree with me. I have a headset and a number of us in the, uh, in the community virtual library and at San Jose State University's Vacara Virtual Centers for, Center for the Archival and Record Administration. We've been exploring a lot of virtual environments with headsets 
And we firmly believe that a virtual environment like Kitely, where we, where we are right now, is virtual reality. It's simply virtual reality on a desktop. Virtual reality is a space that is real with real people in a simulated world. And that's what this is. I'm just not viewing it through a headset. I'm viewing it on my desktop. And currently, I prefer viewing, viewing it on a desktop because on a, on a headset, I sometimes feel my hands are tied behind my back. I, I don't have the productivity tools that I have here in Kitely where I can type, move my camera, interact with a lot of different people and have a lot of tools. On a headset, I'm trapped inside one sort of a bubble and it has its advantages. It may be beautiful. There's a huge wow factor of, wow, I'm swimming with dolphins. They're right beside me. I could reach out and touch them. And so it is, it might be beautiful, but it's less productive. So I think for education, both of these types of virtual reality have their, their place. And for now, for the, really for the, uh, for the next few years and perhaps for much longer, both will, uh, will be um, something that is very useful for education. Uh, does anybody agree with me on that? Or does anybody think maybe VR is going to overtake everything? <laughs> but our VR um, museum world on the other side of the island um, tells a lot about different VR worlds that we have gone into. There's very, there's a uh, and, uh, there's so many tools to to juggle. Here's here's a meta literacy tool that I want to mention. Discord. Are any of you on Discord? If you're in virtual environments, today I had so much sound trouble. I wanted to share with my own camera on a different computer. Nothing worked. But you know, as a meta-literate, meta-modern citizen, I'm kind of used to it. So I just thought, oh, well, we're just going to have to go to plan B and not be nervous about it. I wanted to use my other computer so I could zoom in and show you some of the virtual reality tools um, that we have been exploring. And we welcome you to come explore, too. You can contact me later if you would like to explore virtual reality and virtual worlds for education. And um, Eric saying, yes, VR needs to solve the typing problem and have better in-world build tools. We are yet to find a VR world that has a good interface that we can actually interact and share and teach inside, like we can right here in Kitely or in Second Life or any of the open source world. Uh, we did a presentation for the MOOC on the Community Virtual Library Education Network. If you want to share your own office hours and network with us, feel free to um, to come and you know talk to me about that, and we can get your view on the uh, on that network and we can get in touch with that. TV uh, Education Network, you can write me in the back chat if someone needs it. So in closing, um, I want to see if anyone agrees with some of those, these new terms. If you hadn't heard of meta literacy before today or you hadn't heard of metamodernism, what do you think? Do you like those terms? You may be hearing more about those terms in the future, and next week, um, if you're watching the recording, you might miss this. But if you're, if you're here today, next week on September the 25th, I believe that's Friday, at uh, the Nonprofit Commons in Second Life at 9 o'clock Pacific time, we're going to do some symbolic modeling of meta literacy. And people can build models of how they feel about juggling all these tools. Are you frustrated with it? Is it sometimes overwhelming? Or are you comfortable with it? Is it just an ebb and flow? And we're going to see what kind of models people build. If you're interested, um, you're welcome to contact me because we're looking for some volunteers or you can simply come and watch. It's really interesting, fascinating to watch symbolic modeling, which is something by Marley Molina, Alina in Second Life, um, to watch someone build right in front of your eyes and talk about what their build represents. And they're going to, to, to do that on the term meta literacy. So if you're available Friday at 9 a.m., uh, join us in Second Life for symbolic modeling of meta literacy. 
Yeah, you're using the meta, just the, you know, it, it, it's quite obvious to everyone, everyone that metadata now is really, that's what a librarian does, is look at metadata. Ever since the card catalog disappeared, <laughs> everything's gone meta. You know, we don't, I mean, I am actually old enough to have typed catalog cards and put them in a box. Children today in school have never seen a card catalog. They have no idea what that is. A library used to be a physical place with physical cards that told you about books. And now everything is meta. Metadata runs the internet. And so um, I think meta literacy just fits. It fits with the fact that we live in both a virtual and a physical world. Sometimes more of our time is spent virtually. Just look around. If you see everybody looking at their phone, <laughs> they're not with us. <laughs> they're elsewhere. I also like to say, because here you are looking at an avatar, and if you've never done that before, you might be saying, oh, what's she just looking like a cartoon character for? Well, this is the real me. If you could see my face on Zoom, it would still be this, the real me. Whether or not you have an avatar, we all live in virtual worlds. When you look at someone on the bus and they're staring on their phone instead of looking out at the beautiful changing seasons, they're in a virtual world. We all live in virtual worlds. And we need to learn how to be good digital citizens. So my apologies for all the tech troubles today. And um, Eric, are you the one that ended up sharing your screen? I want to thank you very much. I think um, that's another point is that in, in digital culture, we can't do it alone. You cannot possibly keep up with all these tools alone. I have learned how to do everything that I'm doing at this Digital Citizenship Museum because of people like you who have helped me. You can't learn how to build these environments, script and make all the things happen and learn changing computer code. Um, People like Dawn here, who's a great builder and scripter and has made beautiful things for the community virtual library. I rely on other people like that to help help me uh, become meta literate because we have to do, we have to learn in collaboration. So thank you for uh, sharing the stream today and for all of all of you uh, for being part of my professional learning community. And hope to see you again throughout the MOOC. Uh, this virtual world, world MOOC 2020 has been a great event, a great example of collaboration. Um, they've been doing it every year for, for several years, and um, I hope to see all of you around the MOOC the rest of the month. Oh, one more thing, don't forget to come tomorrow if you want to see Spendalon Library right here in Titan. Tomorrow at the MOOC at um, noon Pacific time, Spendalon Library is going to share they lost everything. They were in InWorlds. InWorlds is a virtual world that closed. Talk about archival. They were able to rebuild their entire beautiful library of Spendalon. So come here to Enkitely tomorrow and you can see a beautiful library that most of their genres that they focus on are sci-fi, steampunk, and fantasy. So it should be a fun tour at noon tomorrow. Hope to see you there. Bye, everybody. Wish I could Thanks. wave with my physical world, but they're technology trouble. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. See you tomorrow bright and early. And we're going to be looking at Minecraft. So see you then. Thank you, Eric. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Eric, for your help.